And once again, we welcome Pastor Rick to the pulpit with the message the Lord's put on his heart for us this day. Well, as always, praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see each of you here this morning, to see some visitors here that, uh, again, are always uh, welcome and always good to have with us. I'd like to ask you again to take your Bibles and turn back to Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 4. We're going, to, we're going to continue in our uh, uh, setting forth of this passage of Scripture. And what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at this section of Galatians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul, really having finished up his primary point that he's been making in this epistle, that we are justified by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, that we have received through the work of Jesus Christ that full status of sonship and have been adopted into the family of God. As a matter of fact, that hymn that we just sung reflected something of that in the final stanza when it said this, with confidence I now draw nigh, with confidence I now draw nigh, and Father, Abba, Father, cry. This great privilege of you and I being able to call God our Father, to speak to him in the most tender terms, to say, Abba, Father, is all the result of the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. And the benefits of, those work, of that work you have received by way of faith in him. And this is the point that the Apostle Paul has been making in the book of Galatians, that by way of faith in Jesus Christ, you are fully accepted of God. And this is something, again, that he has been emphasizing throughout this entire epistle. Now, what's going to be interesting as we come to uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4, and as we look at verses 8 on, what we're going to find is that the Apostle is going to kind of revisit the Galatians with the questions as to what has gone wrong in their thinking. How is it and why is it that they have, def or they seem to be uh, being seduced to defect from Christ? Paul is going to appeal to them, and Paul is going to show them, again, in light of these great privileges that they have in Christ, how is it that they could ever think of forsaking Christ and embracing some other form of religion? For the Apostle Paul and for every one of us who have truly experienced the saving grace of God, the thought is, is unfathomable. How could we forsake Christ to embrace some other form of religion, some other form of philosophy, some other world and life view? And so what I want to do here this morning is I want to take a look at Galatians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 8 through 11 here this morning. And what we're going to see primarily is that the Apostle Paul sets before us that great fact that every true minister of the gospel reflects the love of Jesus Christ for the church and does everything that in his power in order to bring individuals to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And once they have embraced Christ by faith, that same gospel minister is very insistent and is very careful to make sure that they never defect from that great reality. Now, one of the things that we know by way of the saving work of Jesus Christ, that there is a certainty to it, there is a finality to it, there is, a, there is an assurance uh, that is given in the gospel. We know that the work that Jesus Christ begins in the soul, he will indeed, he will indeed complete. But one of the things that the Apostle Paul is dealing with, not only here in the book of Galatians, but in a number, in, in a number of places in, the, uh, in, 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 uh, in his writings, is the fact that there may be individuals, yes, who are truly saved, and again, their, 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 their salvation is secure, but there are also those who come into the church that may or may not be truly trusting in Jesus Christ. There are those who come into the church and they seem to walk with Christ for a while and then something happens and they and they forsake the way of the gospel. Well, this is what Paul is concerned with here in this passage of scripture. He wants to make sure that the Galatians are not being seduced away from that simplicity which is in Christ. And what is the simplicity that is in Christ? It's that sinners of every kind, of every stripe, of every nature, sinners of every kind, as I said before, it can be fully forgiven by God through faith in Jesus Christ. There is in the work of Jesus Christ, by way of his cleansing virtue, by way of his cleansing blood, full forgiveness of all of our sins. That was the very message that Paul preached in the book of Acts to the Galatians. Remember what he said in excuse me, Galatians chapter 13, verses 38? He says that you can be forgiven through Jesus Christ from all things from which you could not be forgiven by the law of Moses justified from all things which the law of Moses could not bring justification. And so again, Paul is emphasizing this point, your salvation and my salvation in and through Jesus Christ. But the Galatians were being seduced, were they not? 
They were being tempted away from the, the truth of the gospel. And so Paul, again, will be insistent on reminding them, how could they forsake? How could they move away? How can they embrace once again those things that once marked their life before they came to faith? Well, let's go to Galatians then, chapter 4, and we're going to read uh, uh, verses 4. We're going to read verses 8 through 11, and we're going to see the point that Paul is making here. No, actually, you know what? Let's start with verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 11. Uh, Paul is, again, as I've said before, he is in a tightly reasoned uh, section of uh, Scripture here. And so all these thoughts are very, very closely re related. So we'll start in Galatians chapter 4 and read down through verse 11. Notice what the Apostle Paul says here. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all but as under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the, under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the, under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God had sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, where unto you desire to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Well, did you see from verses 8 through 11 how the Apostle Paul is again revisiting the Galatians themselves and, make, themselves and making an appeal to them? How is it that you could be turning away from Christ? How is it that you could be going back to these weak and beggarly elements? And he's referring there to their time in paganism. And so what I want to do here today is I want to take a look at this passage of Scripture under that heading that every true minister of Jesus Christ does all within his power to bring the people of God securely under the hearing of the gospel that they might never turn back to the life that they once lived. That's what we see in this passage of scripture. And I hope by the grace of God, I can set that here before you. Well, the first thing I want you to see here then this morning by way of this by way of this, uh, this motivation and this characteristic that we see of Paul, his desire to see the Galatians secure in Christ, this, this is something, again, that is really a blessing of God. It's very interesting that when we look in Scripture, one of the things that we see is that God has promised, again, to his people that he would give his people pastors or shepherds after his own heart. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, where, the, where God says through the, through, the, through the prophet Jeremiah, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Well, that's what Paul is in this passage of Scripture. He is that very type of pastor that God had promised there in Jeremiah that he would give, again, the people of God, pastors after his own heart, pastors who would feed with knowledge and understanding. And that's what Paul is doing here. He has been giving this emphasis on the great doctrines of the gospel, the doctrines of justification by faith alone, the doctrine of adoption. He's going to pick up, we might say this, another theme of the, one of the great doctrines of the scripture, and that's the fact that you and I are known of God in a saving way, and he'll, bring, he'll make mention of these things. And so again, Paul is here showing his great love and concern for the Galatians. It is a mark of every true, truly called minister of the gospel that they desire to see the people of God secured in the work of Jesus Christ. Well, Paul's love, again, has been expressed for the Galatians uh, throughout this entire epistle. It was expressed for the Galatians when he was first preaching to them in the, in, the, in the book of Acts in chapter 13 and 14. You remember there he preached the gospel uh, in Galatia, and both in the 13th chapter, but also in the 14th, 14th chapter. And do you remember in the 14th chapter, that's where he was stoned and left for dead. Paul loved these people, you see. He was willing, again, to give himself in, in complete service for their well-being. He was not a hireling who would flee when things got difficult. Paul loved these Galatian Christians. We see this again in verse, uh, in verse 11 of, of chapter 4 here. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What's he saying here? I'm fearful for you. 
My heart is concerned for you. I'm concerned that you may be losing sight of the preciousness of Christ. Oh, may it never be. He brings that he picks up the same idea in verse 19. Notice what he says in verse 19 of chapter 4. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Do you see Paul's tenderness? My little children. Oh, the way he engages the Galatians in this epistle, it's really something to see. Sometimes he says to them, oh, foolish Galatians. Sometimes he says, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. I can't believe that you're being so bewitched. Other times he appeals to them as brethren. Here he appeals to them as children. You see, he loves these people, the people of God, who for whom Christ has bled and died. He loves them. Every true minister of the gospel is to have this kind of love for the people of God. And this kind of love, again, that, uh, that, a, that, a, that a true minister of the gospel has is not something that's self-generated in the minister himself, but rather it's a reflection of the love of Jesus Christ for his church. And every minister, as I said before, is really a reflection or is to be a reflection of the love that Christ has for his church. And there was Christ, again, dying for you and dying for me. And there was Christ, obedient unto death. And then, and, and, and what we see by way of his ministers that are truly called, they convey this. They convey this both in word and in deed. And that's exactly what Paul did. And this will become kind of the basis of our outline. We're going to see how that Paul loved the Galatians by way of the doctrine that he taught. And then we're going to see, secondly, that Paul loved the Galatians by way of the life that he lived. Let's take a look at these things then. So understand, as I said before, this great love uh, that, the, that the apostle has uh, for the Galatians is something of a mark of the work of God in his heart. And it's a blessing of God to have these kind of ministers that love the, the, the people of God. So what I want you to see here now is that Paul was communicating uh, and showing this concern and this love for the people of God, as I said before, in two ways, uh, both by that which he taught and, that, and, and the way that he lived. And the first thing I want you to see is how he loved them by way of his teaching. Now, he loved them by way of his teaching in the fact that he was not content to leave them under any kind of a system that would draw them away from Christ. You remember what he said in, 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 the, in, the first, in the first chapter of the book where he talks about if anybody comes and preaches to you another gospel than that which I have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul was insistent there was a, that there was only one gospel and that gospel, as I've said before, was all bound up in the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. As a matter of fact, take your Bible and just go back a few pages to Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. And you might remember we gave a particular emphasis to this passage of Scripture as we started preaching it in, in our series here. Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 4, where the Apostle Paul says this about Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. That he might give him, that he, that he gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us. You see, this is the gospel. This is that teaching that Paul is giving. And so what I would say to you even here right now, do you understand that the gospel is all bound up in the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross? Yes, he bled for you. He died for you, you see. And the apostle Paul would not let another form of religion come in and undermine that. He would emphasize over and over again, again, the value of the death of Jesus Christ on your behalf and on my behalf. And so he does this by way of teaching. Another way that he does this by way of teaching is that, is that he develops, you remember, that, that whole doctrine of justification by faith alone. And you remember what that is, don't you? You remember that justification by faith alone is that great emphasis that as you and I stand before God as judge of all the earth, you and I can stand before God fully and freely forgiven of all of our sins. Over and over again in Scripture, God is presented as the judge of all the earth. And by way of that reality of Jesus Christ paying the debt for your sin and my sin, we can be acquitted in the sight of God. He emphasized the great doctrine of justification by faith alone. That, I would say this, that was, this is the primary and the essential doctrine that he teaches in this passage of Scripture in the book of Galatians. But the other thing that I would have you to remember is this. Just recently as we came to the end of chapter 3 and then into chapter 4, what was the doctrine that Paul began to pick up on at that time? He, if I can say it this way, he moved on from justification to now give emphasis to the great doctrine of adoption. Do you remember how we emphasized that last week? You remember how we spoke of the fact that by way of the work of Christ, you and I are adopted into the family of God. And the point that the Apostle Paul was making by way of this idea or this truth of adoption, the point that he is making is essentially this. 
Having come into this status of adopted children, the idea is following the ancient uh, practice of adoption and not so much the, the modern uh, practice of adoption. And in the ancient practice of adoption, what would happen was essentially this. Somebody would adopt usually a male adult into his family. And he would adopt that male adult into his family in order that he would have the, the oversight of all of his estate in order that he might be able to run it, in order that he might be able to guide it and direct it. And the idea is essentially this. That when you are adopted into the family of God as a mature or adult son, you, are, you, you have the full privileges and status of being a son of God. You are not a child in the house. You are not a minor in the house. But rather you have this full blessing and that's the key. You have the full blessing that God gives through Jesus Christ. And the point is this. And again, this is what he was talking about earlier when he says you're not under minors, you're not under a pedagogue, you're not under a tutor, you're not a minor in the house without the full privileges. Why is that important? Because Paul wants you to understand that on the basis of the, of the, of the work of Jesus Christ on your behalf, you have every blessing that you could possibly have in Christ. And that's significant because now the Galatians were tempted to go back to the law or go back to their paganism. And what Paul is saying, what Paul is, saying is, is, is essentially this. You have everything that you can ever conceive of in Christ. Why would you go back? And that becomes something of an idea or a thought that we must deal with it ourselves. There are, these, there are these seductions in the world today that we face. Uh, there are these systems that we are confronted with. There is this pull of the world by way of its morality or of its philosophy and sometimes even its religion. And when the, and when the Apostle Paul speaks about the elementary things of the world, the weak and beggarly things, he's referring to any kind of worldview, any system of religion, any system of, of morality or philosophy that would seduce us away from Christ. And Paul is saying essentially this, compare the two. And the one is weak and beggarly compared to what Christ is giving you. And so again, what we see in this passage of scripture is the apostle Paul is teaching. He is loving them by way of the things that he is teaching. Just like, if I can say it this way, just like the promise that God made in Jeremiah that he would give pastors according to his, according to his own heart who would teach and instruct with knowledge and understanding. That's what Paul's doing. He's giving to them doctrinal truth that they can build their lives on. And that's the same thing, again, that the Word of God is doing for us here today. There's a reason why when we come, we talk about what the Scripture says. There's a reason why when we come here, we, we, we open up these doctrines of Scripture. Why? Because it's not just something about how you might feel good about yourself for having come to church. It's how that your mind and your soul might be instructed. And so again, that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He loved them by showing them the truth of the gospel. If anyone preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. He loved them by showing the reality of the doctrine of justification. Your sins and my sins fully forgiven through the work of Jesus Christ. He did that by way of, it, uh, by way of setting forth that glorious doctrine of adoption. You are full sons in the household of God. You can cry out, Abba, Father. He loves them by way of the doctrine that he taught to them. But there's one more doctrine that he's going to pick up here in this passage of Scripture. Look what we see here again in verses 8 and following. Notice what Paul says. He says, Albeit then, when ye knew not God, you did service to them which were by nature no gods. But now, after ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements unto which you desire to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. Now, what Paul is doing essentially at this point is he is, again, dealing with that possibility that the Galatians were being tempted to leave Christ and to embrace a form of religion that would not completely do away with Christ, but would incorporate something else alongside of Christ in order to be accepted of God. And that's what Paul is saying. You're turning back to these weak and beggarly elements. It's kind of interesting when Paul says in verse 8, he talks about that time when they did not know God and they were in bondage to those things which were not God's. Now, again, what Paul is speaking of here is really classically he's speaking about paganism. And again, the, that word paganism is not used in, a, in necessarily a derogatory term. It's just, it's just used as a way to describe the religion of that day. 
And what's particularly interesting is that when you go back to Acts chapter 14, what you find is that Paul, as he is preaching the gospel, and when the gospel is received, again, when, we, when, when, when the miraculous is seen with the preaching of the gospel, those of Lystra want to make Paul, they want to do sacrifice to Paul, to Paul and Barnabas. They see Paul is. Uh, they, they see one is 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 is, is the God. You, well, let, let, let's take your Bible and go to Acts chapter fourteen. So I'm not just doing this on memory. Go to Acts chapter fourteen, and we're going to see verses eight through eighteen. Now remember, in Acts chapter fourteen, Paul was preaching in Galatia, and the and remember, Galatia was not a city. Galatia was a region. And so what we see here in Acts chapter eight. I'm sorry, Acts chapter four, uh, verses uh, verses fourteen uh, through eighteen. Uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, Acts chapter fourteen, verses eight through eighteen. We notice the following, and notice what we have here, Acts chapter fourteen. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lyconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which, be, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands into the gates and would have done sacrifice uh, with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent, uh, they, they, they rent, excuse me, they, they oh, excuse me here for one minute here. My notes are out of order. And not only, are, not only are they out of order, they are missing right now. So just give me a minute here. So Acts chapter 14, and, and we left off at verse uh, 14. When, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they rent their clothes and they ran in among the people crying out, saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without a witness, and that he did good and gave, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And what I want you to see here is that what Paul is saying to the Galatians now is reflecting that paganism that they came out of, which is given to us here in Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, a, mir a miracle was performed. In Acts chapter 14, the gospel was preached. And how did these Gentile pagans respond to it. They responded to it by way of their paganism. And what the apostle did is he set before them the Lord Jesus Christ. He preached the gospel. And now as he's writing the book of Galatians, he's asking the question, why are you going back to these things? And whether it is going back to the paganism that we see here in Acts 14, or even if it is going back to the forms of Judaism that they were being enticed with by way of the Judaizers, Paul's point is, why are you going backwards? You, 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 are, you, you are going, again, you, it's, it's a retrogression. It's, it's, not, it's not an advancement. Why are you going back? And the point that the Apostle Paul is making is, Galatians, don't you understand that you have every spiritual blessing in Christ? And so when the Apostle Paul goes on to say there again in Galatians 4, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly things, what he's referring to is a comparison between the gospel of Christ and the religions of man. The gospel of Christ and the philosophies of man. The gospel of Christ and the morality of man. And what I want you to see here again, that when we talk about this idea of these things being weak and beggarly, why does Paul refer to it in that way? Well, he says that the, that the religions of this world, the, the, the morality, the philosophy of this world is weak because it cannot save from the power of sin. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel saves sinners not only from the penalty of sin, but the gospel saves sinners from the power of sin. And I have to press this upon you right now. Do you know what that is? Do you know what that power is in daily practice? Do you know what that power is by way of its, by way of its accompaniment in your life? That you live this life again knowing that God himself has worked on your behalf not only to forgive you of your sin but to break the power of reigning sin. Oh again do you know what it is to have this freedom in Christ 
to know that you can say no to all of your temptations, that you can say no to sin. This is the power of the gospel. I remember years ago, my first pastor saying, for, some, for whatever reason, it, the, the, the saying just stuck in my mind. He said, and, and, and the saying was not original with him, but he said, he said, philosophy is powerless in the face of sin. Philosophy can't break the power of sin, but the gospel does. Again, that's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of, of, the, gospel of, Jesus, of, of, gospel, uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. Oh, the power of God. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is, again, to, to have not only the forgiveness of sins, but the freedom of the, of the pool and the tug of sin? This is one of the great things of the gospel. And I would even say this to you. I would challenge you with this. Every true child of God loves that aspect of the gospel that it has broke the power of commanding and compelling sin. And so again, when Paul talks about these forms of religion as weak, that's what he means. These forms of religion can't save you. That even has to be said about the forms of, a, of the Mosaic law. The, lo, the Mosaic law was not able to save either. That's the point that Paul made in Galatians 13, of verse 38. That through him, through Christ, you can be justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Oh, the power of the gospel. Do you know it? Do I know it? Do you long to know more of it? I do. And so again, this idea, this, uh, these things are weak compared to the gospel of Christ. But he also says that they are beggarly. And what does he mean by that? By, by, by that, he means that when you take a look at the, at the great spiritual blessings that are yours in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 talks about the riches of his grace. Oh, the riches of his grace. Grace is a beautiful thing in and of itself. And if it didn't have, if it, if it, if it didn't have any qualifying term added to it, it would still be beautiful and wonderful. But Paul is able to talk about the riches of his grace. Paul is able to say again in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, he's able to talk about how, be, how that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Oh, again, the, the, the fullness and the richness. And again, when Paul compares the truth of the gospel with, with the falsehoods of paganism or philosophy or human morality, he says these things are weak and beggarly. How could you turn back to these things? And that's exactly the point that he's making. And I want you to see this. I want you to grasp this. I want this to be part and parcel of your thinking. Why? Because you and I will be tempted by the world at large. You and I will be uh, tempted by way of what the world offers. And it may not be in fleshly sins. It may be in these intellectual sins. And you've heard me say this before. That again, it's one thing uh, when we, we understand when, when young people are, 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 are tempted by, by fleshly sins. But what about those intellectual sins? What about those intellectual temptations that come our way? And so again, I want you to see that Paul is dealing with that. And he's saying, listen, everything else outside of Christ is weak and beggarly. Is there, and I'm not, I'm, not appealing you, I'm not appealing to you to say amen right now, but I have to ask you, is there an amen in your soul when it comes to this? Yes, to compare it to Christ, what does this world have? And so again, the point that Paul is making, again, how turn ye again to these weak and beggarly elements, as he says there in verses 9 and 10. Well, again, the, 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 it's interesting because not only is Paul kind of warning them of, re, of relapsing into their paganism, he's also warning them about falling into the trap of that view of salvation that involves your trusting in Christ and your dependence upon some elements of the law of Moses. When he says here in verse 10, he says this, uh, again, you observe days and months and times and years. Without question, this is, this is almost definitely referring to those, those elements of the Mosaic system. And you remember what the Galatians were faced with. They were faced with that idea, that falsehood, that yes, you must believe in Christ, but you must add something to it in order to be saved. In Paul's day, it was not only the, it was not only the precepts, of, particularly of the ceremonial law of Moses, but it was also the rituals that were included with the, with, the, with the law of Moses. And I would say this to you today, that there are many who are kind of seduced by churches in our day that are very impressive by way of their ritual and very impressive by way of visually what they are. You know what it's like to go in some of these churches, these great cathedrals. And you walk in and the door may be literally maybe 20 feet high and you walk through these massive doors. And immediately your, your vision is taken up and you see all the great architecture. 
And you think, oh, religiously, this must be what it's all about. Not according to what the gospel says. Over and over again, what we see, and the, and the thing that unites both, uh, both these forms of, 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 of Judaism and, and, and the forms of paganism, there's a difference between the two, but there's a similarity. And the similarity is this. They are both basically bound up in externals, whereas the gospel is dealing with the spiritual realities. Jesus says in John chapter 4, we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. And again, while well, we understand that there is, a, a, from a human perspective, an impressiveness with all these things. Oh, you see, the gospel, again, has a simplicity to it. It is the sinner resting and trusting in Jesus Christ alone. And when the sinner comes to rest and trust in Jesus Christ alone, what is the, what is the desire? What is the longing of the minister of the gospel? It's what Paul says there in verse, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in verse uh, uh, 19, how that, how, that, how that in every believer, Christ might be formed in them. What's the purpose? What does, a, what, does the, what does the Christian minister long for? To see Christ formed in people. Let me say this. And I have, let me say this. The, the, the minister of the gospel doesn't desire to see himself formed in people. He desires to see Christ formed in people. How I labor until Christ be formed in you. He doesn't say how I labor. And he doesn't even say this about other humans that are, or maybe exemplary. You know how I love my, my heroes in church history. He doesn't say, oh, how I labor until Martin Luther be formed in you. How I labor until John Calvin be formed in you. How I labor until John Wesley be formed. He doesn't say any of these things. He says, how I labor until Christ be formed in you. I'm saying to you, if I can say this again, I, I know who's here this morning. I want you to know and I want you to understand that not only by way of a minister, hopefully you see that from, 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 from pastoral leadership here, but there are people in this church who are trying, who are working, who are praying that Christ would be formed in you. There are people in this church who have concern for your soul. There are people in this church who get who who get somewhat uh, uh, disturbed when they when they hear maybe you're going in this direction or in that direction. When they see maybe your love for Christ on the wane, they're concerned about that. Why? Because they want to see Christ formed in you. They want to see you living in the fullness of the blessing that Christ has. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. All the riches of his grace. And so you see again, this is what the Apostle Paul. And do you understand, as I said before, here is the Apostle Paul. He is loving the people of God by way of that which he taught. But what I want you to see here as well, that not only did he love the people of God by that which he taught, he also loved the people of God by that which he did. Notice again in verse 11, I'm afraid of you, lest after I have bestowed upon you, I'm sorry, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Here was a man. Here was a man sent by God. Here was a man that was no hireling. Here was a man, that, uh, again, that, who did not flee when difficulty came. Here was a man, again, who pleaded night and day uh, with individuals that they might know the fullness of, of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what we see here is this. Here was a man who was laboring on their behalf. And so he loved them by way of what he taught, and he loved them by way of what he did. And when Paul says this in verse 11, I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What is he talking about? He's talking about essentially this point. You know and you understand my message has been singular. It has been Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's exactly what he says there in, in Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. What does he say? God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That was his great focus. His message, as I said before, was singular. And what he was, what he was fearful of, this laboring in vain, could it be that Paul is saying, could it be that I have set Christ before you in, in, in such a clear way that now, in, in, even in spite of all that, you would be turning back to that? You would be turning back to that which is weak and beggarly? That you would be leaving off Christ for the crumbs of this world? Well, you see, again, it's Paul's fearful that he could have labored in vain. And again, this was something that was, that was very unsettling to him. And what, what we're going to see here shortly, we're going to see here for, uh, next week, we're going to see how the, Paul is able to express this confidence in the Galatians. And what we're dealing with here is something of a, of a touchy issue because what we're dealing with here is this, is this potential for individuals who have embraced some form of the gospel to in some way, shape, or form defect from the gospel. And Paul is saying, oh, listen, I hope that doesn't happen. My, I'm, I'm concerned about you that I may have labored in vain. 
Every true minister of the gospel labors for uh, labors to have Christ formed in his hearers. That's what he desires to do. And so in this passage of scripture, again, what we see is here is Paul again laboring for these Galatian believers because he loved them. Well, as I said before, this this presents to us not only the Apostle Paul, but, but every minister of the gospel. As I said before, uh, he's a, a true minister of the gospel is not a hireling. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. But he that is a hireling, in other words, he's just a hired hand. He that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are, who, whose own sheep are not, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he is a hireling, is a hired hand, and cares not for the sheep. And Jesus says here in verse 14 of John 10, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I and, 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 and am known of mine. And that's the point that Paul is making when he says there in verse 9, Howbeit when you did not know God, now you know God and are known of him. And what Paul is doing when he says that, he is giving priority to the fact that you know God because God first knew you, not only by way of his, of his omniscience, he knows every soul. Oh, but those whom he has chosen to himself, he knows in a special way. You remember what John says, we love him because he first loved us. And there is this sense in which whenever you see these impulses and these tugs of love for the, in, the, in the heart for the things of God, re rejoice in that. And thank God for that. That's a sign of God working in your heart. And do not, do not dismiss these things. Ask that God will work more and more of that in your heart and in your soul. And so the Apostle Paul was no hireling. The Apostle Paul warned the church at Ephesus and warned the elders at the church of Ephesus that they would not be these type of ministers. You remember what he says in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through, 30, through 31. He says the following, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves... Enter in among you. Yeah, not true gospel ministers, but grievous wolves shall enter in among you. And of your own self shall men rise up, speaking perverse things, listen to this, to draw disciples after them. Paul was fearful that he labored in vain, not that people would forsake him, but that they would forsake Christ. Do you remember what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1? He says there were people there who were preaching the gospel out of contention. And what does he say? He says, he says listen, I, I, it doesn't matter to me. So long as they're preaching Christ. If they're preaching Christ, I will rejoice. Paul was not seeking to bring people to himself. He was seeking to bring people to Christ. Every true gospel minister desires that, you see. They're, they're, if I can say it this way, the, the, the minister of the gospel doesn't want a fan club. The minister of the gospel wants a church that loves Jesus Christ. And so this is the thing that he's bringing out. Paul says again in verse 31, that therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn every one of you day and night with tears. This is the other thing that the minister of the gospel does. He warns. He could have said to these, to these uh, uh, Galatian believers, and, and believe it or not, I think in many ways some of the ancient world, particularly in, in the Roman world, had more tolerance for these competing religions, we might say, uh, than, than what we see is the, develop in the gospel. And, and the Galatians could have easily found themselves in an environment and said, well, it doesn't matter what God you worship. But Paul doesn't say that. Paul, and again, Christ doesn't teach that. And therefore, Paul warns. Notice again there in verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone day and night with tears. And that's what the minister of the gospel wants to do. That's what Paul is doing in this passage of Scripture. He said, how are you turning back to these weak and beggarly elements? He says, I'm fearful for you. He says later on there in verse 19, I stand in doubt of you. And Paul is using everything within the means that God has given to appeal and to urge and to move and to, and to bring these Galatian believers again to be settled on Christ. And so again, here is Paul again exemplifying for us what God had promised in Jeremiah, that there would be these faithful pastors. You know, it is very interesting that when you look at what God requires of pastors and ministers, which Paul is exemplifying here, what, Paul, what, what, Paul, what we see Paul doing here, is that uh, one of the interesting things is that we see that in the Old Testament, we have a number of passages of Scripture that give us a very clear, a very clear indication of what God expects of ministers. Listen to these passages of Scripture. And some of you I've read these two before. Listen to these passages of Scripture. Listen to Jeremiah 23, verses 1 and 2. Woe be to the pastors. 
that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit you with evil, with the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. Here in the Old Testament, we have a passage of scripture that ought to be in every, if I can say it this way, every course of what pastoral theology is all about. There is this condemnation that is coming through the prophet Jeremiah. Ezekiel says that, again, God says the same thing through Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came unto me, Ezekiel 34, verses 1 through 6. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and you clothe you with wool. You kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The disease you have not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. And they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field. They went back to their old ways. They went back to their paganism. They went back to their religious works. You see, God speaks against the shepherds, against the pastors. Isaiah 56, verses 10 through 11, we read this. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving the slime. What is this idea they are dumb dogs? They can't bark. When these men see the danger, they say nothing about it. Let threats come to the church of Christ. Let threats come to the people of God. And they're saying nothing. Dumb dogs, they can't even bark. And so you see again these the emphasis that we see in this passage of Scripture. Now, you know what's particularly interesting in this passage of Scripture, in these passages? Whenever God is bringing out the failure of the ministers and the pastors, that in these passages of Scripture, in the very context, these passages ultimately move to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as the great shepherd of the sheep. In Jeremiah 23, one of the great Old Testament prophecies concerning Christ now, again, I read verses 1 through 3 of Jeremiah 23. Listen to what verses 5 and 6 say. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. This is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. That's a reference to Jesus Christ. And what's beautiful in these passages of Scripture is that we see where there's human failing, Christ himself steps in, and Christ becomes the great shepherd of the people. The hireling may flee, but Christ will not. The hireling may run in a time of trouble, but Christ will give his life for his people. It's the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. You shepherds, you have failed to do it. I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among the sheep that are scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and I will deliver them. And it goes on to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I want you to see again every true minister of the gospel love the church of Christ because Christ has worked in that minister a love for the people of God. And so again, this is what Paul is doing, and this is why Paul is appealing, and this is why Paul is warning, and this is why Paul is saying, I'm afraid of you. This is why Paul is saying, I'm in doubt of you. This is why Paul is saying, oh, foolish Galatians. How would, you, how would, how would most people respond if this is the way their, their pastors engage them? Are you fools here? What has happened to you? I stand in doubt of you. And we don't see them. We say, well, you know, pastor, you should affirm them. You should make them feel good. Listen, there may be a time for that. But when the gospel is being, when the, when the threat of the gospel is being undermined and when souls are in the balance, will the pastor be a dumb dog and not bark? And so here is the Apostle Paul, this great love that he has for the church of Jesus Christ. Well, how do we apply a passage of scripture like this? How do we bring it to each one of us? And I would suggest that we do this in three ways or in three categories, I might say. First of all, I, I would apply it to those who, who, who know God and are known of God, who love God and are walking with God. Some of you, maybe most of you might be familiar with an old book. It's old now, probably 40 or 50 years old, written by uh, an Anglican a theologian by the name of uh, J.I. Packer. That name is probably not unfamiliar to most of you here. 
When the beginning in the in the opening title in the opening chapter of the book, Knowing God, would highly recommend it, he writes this. He says, I walked in the sunshine with a scholar who had recently, uh, who had effectively forfeited his prospects of academic advancement by clashing with church dignitaries over the gospel of grace. Oftentimes it comes down to this, doesn't it? This beautiful gospel of grace that legalists and, the, and, and, and people who think they can do things to be pleasing to God in, their, in and of themselves always clash with. Again, a scholar who had, effect, who had effectively forfeited the pro, his prospects of academic advancement by clashing with church dignitaries over the gospel of grace. Listen to what Packer says of what this man said. But it doesn't matter, he said at length, at length for I've known God, and they haven't. He goes on to say, the remark was more, was more of a parenthesis, a passing comment on something that I had said, but it stuck with me and set me thinking. And the point that Packer makes is essentially this. Do you understand the preciousness and the value of knowing God and being known of God? And so for those of you who know that, my appeal to you is this. Continue to grow in your love for Jesus Christ. Let your love of Jesus Christ be the great motivation of all you do. Let your love for Jesus Christ be the great filter through which everything is run. You see this idea, and again, be, understand, understand this again, that these, these competing loves that we are faced with are great challenges to the people of God, and God calls us to be faithful to Him throughout. The second thing I would, or the second category that I would apply this to, or for those of you who may be in the, in, the, in the same situation that the Galatians were in. Maybe you're here this morning and you come and thankfully we had the organ here, or the, the piano here this morning. But in the last few weeks, here we were singing our a cappella and there was really nothing, you know, religiously impressive about what we were doing from an external point of view. Singing off key, missing notes. We come in, there's plain white walls, and there's really nothing to this place. And, and you maybe you go to a wedding or to a funeral, and you go to a friend's church or this and that, and you see all of this great, this great kind of all these things that attend or, or, or go along with religion. And you think, boy, this is what religion is all about. I was talking to a friend of mine recently that sadly within the, the evangelical world, there, there are many churches, that, again, they... They, 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 they take on the, the form of, a, of almost like a theater. Uh, and I don't mean just by way of the seating arrangement. I mean by way of what happens. And so it would not be unusual. Hopefully it's not across the board, but it may not be unusual that there might be a certain kind of light show or there might be smoke show, whatever, fog machines and all of this. And I've said to my friend, you know, this is just another way to attempt to appeal to the flesh when it comes to religion. That's all that it is. And I says, consider how somebody who comes from a more liturgical, a more high church kind of background, sees that in comparison. You mean you're going to compare a fog show with the incense that rises up continually? You're going to compare lasers with the lighted candles that go all the way around the church? So what I want you to see is that you may be tempted to go back into these ways. Or you may be tempted by some highly developed philosophical school of thought that you think has just all the answers that the gospel doesn't have. Remember what that good old pastor said? As I said before, philosophy is powerless in the face of sin. Your philosophy cannot break the power of sin, but the blood of Jesus Christ can so if you're in that place that the Galatians were in, I call you, I call you to hear the words of Paul. How turn you, how could you even think of turning back to these weak and beggarly things? And the third group that I would apply this to, or to maybe those of you who may be here who have departed and defected from Christ. And maybe what the Galatians were dealing with is in the rear view mirror for you. And maybe you think, yeah, that's, I left that years ago been doing just fine with it, without it. I want to appeal to you. And I want to appeal to you in the name of Jesus Christ and by way, of, by way of the love of Christ. And I want you to know that our Lord Jesus Christ is there calling you back to himself. There's no barrier to keep you from Christ right now. 
the love of Christ will draw you. You understand that Jesus says, even though you might find yourself in the midst of great difficulty, maybe you're not in difficulty. Even though you might find yourself in the place of great difficulty, what does Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Remember what he says in John chapter 6, those who come to me I will not cast out. The words of the prophet in the Old Testament, come and let us return unto the Lord. And so this passage of scripture, which conveys for us, again, everything by way of the love of Christ and the working out of that love through, God, through ministers of the gospel, appeals to each and every one of us, no matter what our condition or situation may be. If you're here walking with Christ, continue, rejoice in the blessings that you have in Christ. If you're in that place, that what, what the prophet calls that valley, of, that valley of decision, oh, you see again, decide once again, hold firm to Christ. If you're there and these things are in the, in, in the rear view mirror, understand that Christ is still calling you to himself. Understand that Christ will bring you back to himself. Well, here is this passage of scripture. Oh, may God, may God, may God work these things in us. May he give us a love for these truths to be known of God, to be adopted in the family of God, to be fully justified from all of our sins. And may God grant to his church, this church and other churches, pastors after his own heart. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, how we thank you for this, your word. Give us grace, we pray, Lord God. Give us grace. Give us grace to not be taken up by the weak and beggarly elements of this world, but to fully rest and lean on Christ. Oh, grant this, we pray, Father. Yes, for our good, but ultimately for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.